You know, what's interesting is I just, uh, there was just an article that came out on March 11th and it was about basically new venture deals um, that have, have basically been funded since the pandemic started. And the top three uh, deals uh, were basically biotech, health tech, and fintech. So um, I guess, you know, kind of proving that what's going on right now that even in, in a pandemic, there's a lot of activity in obviously the health tech space. And I guess it, it, it begs the question, you know, what factors really do play a role in the adoption of use or use of telehealth, right? You know, obviously we're talking about broadband here too, but you know, what are the, what are those factors that really, you know, impact all of us using it? I mean, I know I've used it myself, but, um, you know, what do you guys think? Well, I think most on the nose for this meeting is uh, internet and technology infrastructure, um, both for patients and providers. And, and that goes for urban and rural areas. So even in Denver, we're having a lot of conversations around um, whether or not it makes sense at some point to look at having Wi-Fi be a free public utility, since there are so many people who can't afford the $15 a month for um, internet access or who don't have technology that's compatible um, in the home with a lot of the services that we provide. And then when we look at rural communities or even just you know facilities that have older buildings, um, right? Where it's the internet's not very good or the wiring is old or whatever that looks like of um, broadband and infrastructure is is um, I think definitely one of those fundamental factors. Uh, the next factor that I see a lot of is um, policy and payment uh, in the healthcare system. So making sure that there's a healthcare system that's supported in terms of allowing providers to deliver care in the way that they need to. And, and we still run into barriers around, um, in Colorado at least, barriers around um, what types of providers can be located where and where the patient needs to be located or what kinds of services you can provide and, and what the requirements are on those. And a lot of that can be very restrictive and, and um, isn't, doesn't usually, tends to have a hard time keeping up with how quickly um, the technology and all the different care delivery models evolves. Um, and then just making sure that we have reimbursement models that align with that. One of the things that's really cool about telemedicine is that it really supports um, this movement towards value-based care um, and, and really improving overall the outcomes of care and the cost of cares. Um, but, you know, it's still, a, it's still a new space in terms of how do we evaluate that? How do we, you know, measure those outcomes? How do we really assess that cost and, and prove it in a way that we can justify its continuity? And then I think the third area um, factors that play a role or, you know, so I'm listing barriers, which I think that, um, which um, is not necessarily the same, but the third area is just, um, is knowledge, uh, making sure that people kind of understand it know that they can access it, how to access it, what it means, what to expect, that it is good care, um, all of those things. And so um, factors that play a role in the success of adoption and use of those technologies is, is really thinking about ways to address those three areas. Let's well, ask everybody here, like, I mean, does everybody, if you had to call your doctor right now, do you know if you could actually use telemedicine? Well, we just tested this a couple of minutes. <laughs> I called my doctor to schedule time to try to do something virtually and to understand if there was an option. And there were, they, they knew of nothing. My, my doctor I've been going to for, for years, just family doc, right? Because I'm not exactly really wanting to jump up and run and obviously, you know, go into a, a place to, to have a physical right now. So I wanted to know if there were, there were options. And from, from my, my doctor, there, there, there wasn't. So um, I feel like education may be um, a potential barrier here. I mean, I, I, we obviously have to have internet access, but there's lots of us that, that do have internet access already. But I'm not sure if we really understand everything that's available to us 
already. And, and while my local doctor doesn't, it's obviously forcing me to look at my provider and see what other options I have, because it's probably smart to still do a, a checkup now that I'm older than 29. <laughs> Hot, hot tip for Colorado, to your point, Brian, if you do need a provider, is that all of the commercial payers, so Cigna, United, et cetera, do have telemedicine solutions available through the payer that you can use. Um, so that's always a backup option. And right now, co-pays are waived because um, of COVID. So It's an interesting comment in the, in the chat that from a provider, I guess, that's, that's listening or watching that they're concerned about wanting to advertise because they're worried about reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Um, yes. So yeah. you asked um, Nick about adoption and in general adoption requires things to be easy and things to be valuable. So if we, but we have to think about healthcare now like BC before COVID and AC <laughs> after COVID. So BC, Healthcare was not adopting telehealth to any great extent. I mean, there are there were pockets. I mean, large systems. I spent ten years at the VA at the national level, and they're they've been doing it for ages. Big systems like Kaiser Healthcare, uh, and I think you have Kaiser in Colorado. You know, they've they've adopted it because they want to keep people out of the hospital. They want to keep people out of the emergency room. But most healthcare isn't designed that way. Most healthcare is designed fee for service. You see somebody, you get something done and they get paid. We, so the whole sort of easy and valuable wasn't really an option in most healthcare. Today, it, I mean, all, all bets are off the table right now. We've got healthcare clinics and hospitals that are going down the tubes unless they provide virtual care. All the rules and regulations have been relaxed, the reimbursement has been heightened, and everybody, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a wild, wild west out there, including low-income rural clinics who are trying to adopt telehealth. Um, and so there's been this dramatic change. But one of the things that uh, technology always uncovers is what happens on the ground. Like, does it work well? Does it not work well? I mean, what happens with when you layer on something like telehealth on top of the existing healthcare system, you start uncovering all the facts, uh, all the facts like the infrastructure's not really there, the support's not really there. They can't you know, reach out and help people who are struggling to get in uh, or use the technology. So it's a pretty interesting, dramatic time. It's a very dramatic time. It, you know, my, my, uh, my sister's in, in this field. Um, she runs the Pacific Business Group on Health, and they're, they're sort of a payer coalition working on um, a, a really uh, cost control and, and quality metrics and that kind of thing from the buy side for large employers. But she was she's a bit of an expert. But I'm not, but she tells me, uh, recently, she was telling me that um, a huge number of um, independent practices, those that are left, primary care practices, are at risk of going under. Um, and I, it just, just dawned on me, you know, like, well, yeah, they're like a retail or a restaurant. If you can't go in and buy services, they're, they're not getting paid. So this shift to online is is really, you know, necessary for them to survive even to, to get, they need to get paid by delivering services like this or however they can do it remotely and digitally. So I thought that was quite, um, you know, quite telling. Yeah. I agree. So some Colorado stats are that in Colorado in the last two months, uh, more than 40,000 healthcare workers were laid off or furloughed. Um, and at the same time, we see that uh, more than 86% of providers have switched to delivering services over telemedicine. Whereas uh, BC, before COVID, it was um less than 20 percent across the board so it's been a it's been an insane spike it's uh, really fascinating to watch what's also interesting within that kind of going back to this telehealth definition is that the majority of those visits have actually been over telephone um, there are still quite a lot of um some some interesting challenges related to live video visits especially in 
uh, the space I work in, which is with sort of low income communities and rural communities, um, which have a lot more barriers related to tech access. Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, and not, uh, not making light of it, but I mean, you can only do so much telemedicine, right? I mean, there's no proctology exams over, you know, telemedicine, right? So right. you are making light of it. You are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you could do, you know, I mean, I'm just saying there's only, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. I mean, so there's a line of what's the, the uh, of how far that telemedicine can go without obviously having a, you know, a, a physical appointment, right? Well, we're going to put Docs, docs tend to say that, you sound like a dog. <laughs> but when, when it really comes down to it, 90% of what you do with a clinician is to talk, is to get a history. I mean, there was a comment, um, it's true, if there's, if there's proceduralists, obviously that, that you've got to do face to face. There's a, comment in the, there's a comment in the chat box about mental health, behavioral health, and yes, they're, they've been way ahead of the curve doing virtual care uh, for a long time uh, because all, you know, that is talk, talk therapy. But, but don't, under, don't underestimate how much you can actually accomplish in a virtual visit. I want to go back to something Rachel said earlier, and it's about adoption. And I think of the time I walked into my parents' house and they were FaceTiming with my kids. You know, they, they were incented, right? They, they wanted to talk to my, my kids and see them. And uh, th they were talking to my kids remotely and I just run by, we live in the same town, but they were using FaceTime before I was. And now if you think about all the people that are now using Zoom and walking their children through Zoom, Google Hangouts, or Meet, you know, uh, Skype, FaceTime, whatever for schooling right now, suddenly this, this ability to, to, to receive and, and send information in real time has changed because uh, it, it comes down to ease of use. These are the same parents that I talked about when they had, a, they had a VCR, they can't set the clock on it, but they figured out how to use Netflix, right? So th th there's the, once the technology becomes easy, the adoption comes in, right? It's, it's just right now, it's just a, a, a swirling windstorm of everybody understanding the technology and then if you're a if you're a clinic how do you get the word out you do that right there's no traditional marketing uh, methods anymore there's no you can't put something on the radio you can't put something on in the newspaper or on tv there, there's no way to reach everyone so how do you get the word out even if you offer that but it do, is a do, do a tiktok video what's that do a tiktok video right now <laughs> That is uh, very explicitly the one place that is still considered not HIPAA compliant <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the emergency that they waived all the, the HIPAA restrictions for like Facebook Messenger and all of that. They were like, except TikTok, no TikTok, which I thought was really funny that that needed to be said, but probably did. So. 